Hello, I'm Gretchen Scharnagel here in virtual conversation with the Frank in my capacity as Brecalur or artist. First of all, uh, to know me as an artist, I, from the beginning of my making of art consciously, I often used found object or unusual objects that were around me. Uh, one of the earliest examples of this would be using dirt and glue as a drawing material or even drawing with glue that my professor at the time humorously called my snail trails because they did create these strange resistant milky white trails throughout my drawings that I particularly loved and found that nothing other than glue would create. So I was plugging along using often found objects, uh, more interested in uh, creating art or drawing what was around me, found the residue of life, the remains. And that is how I organically found myself uh, being uh, labeled, but also understanding that I had become an environmental artist. And even though there would be a consciousness of the environmentalness all along because it was where my heart already was. There was a newfound understanding that when I used trash in art, it was not trash that I was upcycling or uh, recycling some material that would normally just be wasted. And so this idea of what is trash and what is not and what is to be wasted and what is not became part of my art. The idea of bricolage is something that I did not know of while I was already doing it. And in fact, this practice I took on of addressing environmental subjects, but making sure my practice was somewhat environmental by trying very hard to reuse materials that I had accumulated rather than buying materials. In some cases also using trash, uh, using things I thought I didn't like, but if I, you know, if I didn't like it the way we often don't like things, which is to throw it away, then I would be adding to the problem. So let me try this material, see if I like it. So bricolage is the practice of creating something new with the things you have at hand. And even if you uh, need a specific tool, you often find a tool that you already have, or maybe a combination of tools that you can uh, make something work. A bricolure uh, would have existed in society as an accepted, uh, uh, an integral part of society during a time that I, I call the time before waste, after some of my summer readings, which included books like Plastics, The Toxic Love Affair, Waste and Want, and currently Garbology. And in Waste and Want, they spoke of a little over a hundred years ago, um, began the ending to the idea that had been up until that point, which is that people, did not view uh, what they had, like what had been used up, what they had they didn't want, um, what was the residual part of what they had used as waste. It was just gotten to whoever or whatever needed it. So there was all sorts of things in place of women selling their kitchen grease to uh, people who went around to buy that. Um, but the Brecalur himself would have been somebody who accumulated things uh, with no strict criteria of what those things were, but then they would also be the person one would go to, I need a thing. And so they had this uh, art form of creating something new that is needed out of what one already has. And so I began to embrace the idea that my art practice hopefully was close to, and if not 
maybe more consciously could become the practice of the Brecalure, which also fit some other of my readings, a, a favorite book that I found recently, in fact, after uh, showing publicly one of my uh, Anthropocene drawings, I was told you should check out this author and um, the book is What's Next and it speaks of eco-materialism, eco-materialism having some real crossover ideas to bricolage except for eco-materialism is uh, born out of a couple of things, one of which is the theory of materialism, which is, and, and what would be called now new materialism, which is not to be confused because it's almost the antithesis of consumerism. New materialism is an absolute consciousness of the materials that we acquire, that we have, that we use, and our waste. And with the idea in mind of its impact to the earth either you know is it mined is a tree cut down for it is the processing of the making of this material caustic to our environment is there caustic byproduct uh or is it that it is the byproduct and therefore a little bit more conscientious um but then your use of it you know, is your use of it wasteful? Is it used for something worthwhile? And what is the life of that thing you're making? And what, you know, what do you do with said byproduct of your work then? And then ultimately, what is the life of your work? So this tapped into some things I had already been uh, playing with myself, which was almost a freak out that I didn't want to add to the bulk of debris of the earth. And so although many, many artists speak of wanting to leave a legacy of a lot of art, I would think to myself, I don't feel that way. Uh, actually, wouldn't it be nice to have no footprint or if there is any footprint, it's, it has some worthiness, some, some reason to be there. And so it was really almost crisis level to try to figure all this out. Having said that, um, so new, that's new materialism. When you add eco-materialism, uh, you are upping the bar on uh, just how responsible to the environment. And so artists who are practicing under this theoretical term eco-materialism sometimes can be pretty far extreme. There is often, uh, let's say, an action as art that has some benefit to our world or to people, but without undue residue, or one only uses, you know, body fluids or organic materials or things that are already there. And so therefore there is no change to our environment having, uh, just change their context. But at a rudimentary level, and this is where I guess I am as an artist, at the rudimentary level, the idea of eco-materialism taps right into bricolage, which is first and foremost, do not be a consumer. Do not be a lover of the new of the acquiring. Do not have the acquiring and the new be your driving force. What do you already have? What is already there? What will not create a situation where a tree is cut down for this? Um, which means though that recycled paper, paper might be okay. Rag paper, if the company's responsible, it could be some chemical issues if one does their deep research, but uh, is the, you know, the castings of cotton clothing companies. Uh, originally, I'd say originally rag paper, which would have been the paper most people would have used even to write a letter or whatever. Uh, its source were people's rags. 
and there was a much more circular flow to things. And so part of what delving into these concepts of waste and want and bricolage and eco-materialism uh, opens up the possibility that there are some things humans already know how to do that have already been done uh, that could create a less frightening future for us all. Some, some people are already working on it. The idea that uh, garbage can be turned into fuel or more uh, responsible recycling practices because, you know, some of them aren't what they appear. But in the end, what all of this awareness has come to is that the first and foremost thing as a brecolor and as an eco-materialist that I could do to be responsible is to use what I already have or to do another practice of the brecolor or the, uh, the communities before waste, which is that there was sometimes an exchange of what was waste to one was sold to somebody else who valued that um, resource. And so therefore, uh, you know, I've gone from a person who might order some art materials and discard the packaging and use the art material. I try to find the art material first in my studio. But if I have to get it, try to find a source where they're not packaging it with things that you disapprove of or that are bad for the environment and or use that packaging in your art. And so some recent pieces, uh, often collage or paper mache have uh, utilized a lot of garbage, but in this concept of bricolage and eco-materialism, which is part of the thing is becoming aware and so uh, in trying to use up my trash as fast as I can in making art and being a little bit prolific in this uh, time of the pandemic, it has made me aware that I had more trash than I could use up in my art. And so that was a little bit of a, a, a moment for me. About seven years ago, uh, a few things had come to fruition. I had experienced uh, the death of a couple of friends, plus I had acquired many things that had been my father's. And most of what we're talking about is the residue of their lives. So I had materials and also through the years, uh, well-meaning people gave me what they considered art supplies, but you know, it might be something really like, uh, an example would be colored pencils like, oh, thank you, these are really lovely colored pencils. But have you noticed I don't really use color in my work and I never use colored pencils. And so, so I had a well-stocked studio and it was well-stocked because of all the things I had acquired through the years, but it was more than well-stocked, it was doubly stocked by having this kind of residue, not only from my own life, but from other people's lives accumulate in my studio. And so the reason about seven years ago, I didn't double check my dates before this talk, but I'm thinking it's about seven years ago. I, for the first time, consciously said, I am going to create an art where the, the foundation is not in what is my subject, the foundation is what do I have? And really, really, really the, the big catalyst of that was a roll of graph paper that my father gave me that dated back to, I believe, the 1940s or 1950s. And I'm sure there still is graph paper, but this graph paper, maybe because of its age, maybe because of it was most likely for engineering, because uh, I'm thinking, well, what did this graph paper have to do with my father's life? But it was unique. And so I decided I'm going to work on this graph paper. You know, the graph itself is a construct that really 
uh, speaks to our soul. It's amazing how often artists gravitate to grids or graphs because there's something lovely about the graph in an instant structuring device or an instant uh, reference to possibly I'm mapping my images. Around the same time, I was taking on another idea and that which is to take ideas from around you consciously, including maybe compositional ideas or reacting to artists that are out there and possibly even things that I don't value, gravitating to things I don't value. So making art about subjects that disturb me or subjects that I don't like. And so uh, without offending anybody who really loves Salvador Dali, Salvador Dali was not my go-to guy. And I would never ever in a million years have considered myself somebody who did surrealism or that I would gravitate to surrealism. But it was proposed to me that I react to a Salvador Dali drawing. And in doing so, I discovered that this thing right under my nose, uh, surrealism, and specifically Salvador Dali's version of surrealism, was a great vehicle for environmental subjects. And so with my graph paper, I decided with the marriage of Salvador Dali to uh, create a work that dealt with issues that I was interested in. Having said that, I also decided that I would not allow myself to purchase any art materials. And in fact, I would work hard to use the materials that had been there for a while. For instance, I had been given a box of antique pencils uh, that were lovely and uh, I, I suspect they might be car cartoonist blue pencils. They looked wonderful. I found them exciting. I strangely liked owning them, but I had never used them. So I was going to use them. And also I had acquired from my friend who had died a, a lovely set of watercolors, uh, the kind in the tray. And certainly I was not considered a watercolorist. And to add to that pot, the paper I was about to use was about the antithesis of what you would ever, ever consider using with any water-based anything. So having said that, uh, in addition to the Anthropocene series, which has been exclusively on this roll of graph paper, which I've not reached the end of yet, the other series that came out of this was actually after my father died, I discovered he had been a hoarder, which at first seemed like a negative because he had a closet full of things that was of no value to anybody, particularly all my siblings. But as an artist, I was like, oh, wait, drawers and drawers and drawers of pencils and pens and other writing stuff. You know, I did have to, you know, eliminate the ones that had dried up or were no good anymore. But, uh, but there were a lot of interesting pencils, uh, some colored pencils that must have been from when he studied engineering in the 1940s at the Colorado School of Mines. And some of these colored pencils I've used in the Anthropocene series because they are colors that just seem so unique. The pencils themselves seem to have characteristics that set them apart from, let's say, sets of colored pencils that I've acquired from other sources, which I use also. But um, he also had some seven, eight, and nine H pencils. Uh, some interesting materials, uh, which the other thing that I would like to talk about is um, the idea of bricolage in reference to what we are uh, making art about. Like, what, what do we use as our symbols? And I'm very influenced by uh, the work of William Kentridge when I've, he I've he heard him speak a couple of times in person. And in video, so I, I'm not even sure which arena he said this, but somebody was asking him about the use of the French coffee plunger in his video 
if you're not familiar with his work, he works like this. He does not use digital processes, nor does he use um, uh, cells like early Disney, but he creates video by drawing and erasing, redrawing, erasing, redrawing, erasing. Uh, but sometimes he needs a transition between two really disparate scenes. And one time he had, say the mine owner, the factory owner, man of wealth, you know, not the good guy of the story. He's in bed. He's a large man, opulence. He is having his breakfast in bed. And he needed to, after showing this scene of this guy in luxury softness, he needed to transition to the mines and the dire, deadly circumstances, the sweat, the, the labor, the darkness of uh, the African black man living in these very uh, questionable conditions during the apartheid. And so he had the coffee plunger go down, down, down. So he's making his French plunger coffee, coffee. But then the plunger keeps going down, digging through the ground till you end up in the mine. And I love this concept. I love being uh, reinforced in the idea that we can just call from our, our life. You know, we're going along in life. We find a bug on the ground, draw that bug. You know, honor that bug. Is it a memorial to that bug? Probably. Um, for my scientist daughter's sake, I might use the word insect instead. Um, so anyway, having said that, my latest piece in the Anthropocene uh, has a pair of scissors in there. And I was looking for something in this piece that was something that would never let you know for sure what it was about. I wanted something and I really did think sharp or dangerous. So I, I wanted something sharp or dangerous, but also something that could be actually the thing that saves you, the thing that cuts you free, helps you, you know, like the good or bad of it is not for sure. And this thing was to be dropped in the picture. And so is the thing dropped like, oh no, it's dropped or is it, it's dropped, oh, thank God it's dropped. Like the danger's out of your hands. Um, and so what came across was in that uh, acquiring of many, many, many things in my father's closet, there had been something I had actually forgotten about, but I was searching around in my bricolage concepts in my studio and sort of remembered, so I started looking for it specifically, I knew it was there somewhere, that my father had had this strange pair of scissors that were ridiculously long bladed compared to the size of the scissors. You know, I had seen other enlarged pairs of scissors for certain uh, seamstresses and things, but this was, you know, kind of a normal size hand grip to the scissors with a really elongated blade. And I thought, because I didn't even know what they were. I didn't, what were they for? I thought they were going to be perfect because uh, I realized that once I drew it, people wouldn't even understand whether I had artificially elongated them or if they were actually longer. So that was part of it. Uh, and that was part of my reason for finding it because it's much easier to just draw a pair of elongated scissors rather than to look at a regular pair and artificially elongate it. And so there we are. It's my French plunger coffee maker it was my elongated sharp shears. I then wanted a ribbon or a string. And again, though, you know, I thought, oh, I don't want to look in, let's say scraps of ribbon. I have a silk or satin or pretty or gift wrappy. And I realized that I had some strange, you know, un, undyed ribbons that had come as packaging to different things throughout my life. And I, I'm a real hoarder of those. So I, I actually had a whole bunch of them. And so I threw them on the ground and I started photographing them to see which one did I like the look of. And 
so again, it was an interesting, uh, you know, found object that what, like, what is a string? Was it to package or to protect? Or is it a lifeline or, you know, is it a tangle? Is the tangle bad? Is the tangle good? I'm not quite sure. But all of those things were uh, part of my playing with the poetry of, uh, you know, bricolage as a uh, poetic way to approach a subject, which had already been fed by, you know, surrealism. You know, I think what I had previously not liked about surrealism was like, you know, why, why are those things in the same picture? They don't make sense to me. And I realized that you know, if you're dealing with people wrecking their planet that they live on and, you know, this is not good for them and it's, there's no good ending to the story. And so it, it, environmental subjects are exactly that. Why are these two things in the same picture? You know, here's a case where this idea of being influenced by what is right under our nose, I also can have one word, one phrase, or one concept influence my art. Tons of my art has come out of hearing something on the news about uh, this or that or the other thing and creating a thing. One of early on in my, in my uh, academic years when I was a student, I was reading William Kentridge Les Miserables, and almost everything he said in there thrilled me. And eventually his artwork, which I didn't even know he created at the time, influenced me too. Here's a piece by uh, Victor Hugo. I think I said William Kentridge. Uh, this piece by Victor Hugo, which is made out of soot and coffee, was a heavy influence of mine after being influenced by the words of Les Miserables. Victor Hugo uh, left over a thousand drawings when he died and is a very positive force in this idea. You know, if you, if you read deeply into his work, he, he also used what was at hand. So that idea of bricolage and using the material uh, kept going on and on and on. And I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some time and go piece by piece of the works that we are going to reconfigure because we are actually applying this concept of bricolage using what is at hand, which, you know, other fields like anthropology, like philosophy, um, my mind's going blank, but an amazingly large number of other fields are taking on the concept of bricolage. And so, one of them uh, talks about using the space you have. And so when this pandemic broke out and I was approached by other people other than the Frank also, and some of them wanted me to speak of, oh, okay, Gretchen, you know, now that there's this pandemic and you can't go anywhere and, you know, you can't, stores are closed and all sorts of things. Like, how are you managing? And I was like, um, well, I already had a lifestyle that forced me to create a studio attached to my house because I began to be an artist not early that I would develop, you know, let's say a lifestyle or methodologies of creating art and then deciding, let's say, to have a family later on. I was plugging along with life and I found myself thinking, oh my gosh, I was a college dropout. I think I'll go back to college. And I had been a biology major turned graphic designer turned college dropout. And so, you know, many years later, I've got two little elementary school kids. And I think I want to go back and finish my degree. And I had this sudden idea it is kind of complex. It's kind of like people would say your stars are aligned, but I had a few people say, three, three different parties say things to me that 
when they came together, uh, said to me that I should be questioning whether or not I should have been practicing art and what about that? And I was basically a person far removed from the art world. I was an at-home mom with two little elementary school kids and practicing bricolage because they would have the coolest school projects made from whatever I had accumulated. But I didn't really recognize that as bricolage at the time. But anyway, so I go back to school. And so I am forced to, uh, so I'm trying to consider, it wasn't the environment at the time. I was considering how can I, without compromising my children's life, uh, I didn't have any extra money. And so how can I use what I have in spaces that I have, you know, succeed as an artist first academically and then beyond. And so I learned to make art in my backyard, in my front yard, in my driveway, originally very much in my dining room, sometimes on the floor of my bedroom, many times. And my kids say this was a life-changing thing for them. They would come home and everything would be moved out of the living room so that I could take over the living room. Uh, which is the largest space in the house, um, to make art. Uh, the most extreme being one of my uh, largest use of trash, which was 550 Christmas tree trunks in my living room, and actually beyond, because even though I have a nice sized living room, 550 Christmas trees, it was throughout, they were throughout my house, whatever. Um, so I already, so even though I have let's say stepped it up slightly uh, and now have a room built on the side of the garage that is officially a studio for me. It maintained this concept of make art where you are. You know, so first of all, I don't have to spend any gas. I can run out and make art, uh, you know, while a pot's boiling on the stove. And also, that addition used some, you know, salvaged materials, leftovers from construction jobs and things, as is my whole house, uh, has a lot of that, where particularly after Hurricane Andrew, I have tons of French doors in the house and th they were found in other people's trash piles, which is why all of my French doors are painted and not natural wood, because I guess that's what they didn't like about them, they got water stained. But anyway, so I already had my studio, I already make art here, I already was practicing premeditatively and intensely the fact that I was making art with what I already had. And so what happened was I became a person that other people were asking, how are you doing this, you know? And so, but then the final cog to that was, but wait a minute, what about showing the art? And so the Frank contacted me and although we were going to take these pieces of the Anthropocene and we were going to, you know, I hang them on the wall. I, I'm not the curator, so I'm not quite sure how they were going to be hung on the wall, but uh, the curator and I, uh, with her idea, had, had the idea of what can we do? to not just have, let's say, a secondary version of your art in a show. And uh, I was way on board because this idea of bricolage also has to do with uh, using what's at hand. And whether people realize it or not, what's at hand right now is exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm talking to you via technology. And so, even though I'm at my house and I don't even know where you are. I'm talking to you, artist talk. And, and so you hopefully will appreciate that technology gave us this other site specific thing we can do. Anyway, so I already was using my materials, already using my space. The Frank talked to me, the only solution, because it had to be uh, a digital show was to say, is there any way? Is there any way to have a show that isn't just a digital second version of a better version 
in person. And I said to the uh, curator, Taryn, well, you know what? Sometimes people don't get to see some details in the work of these Anthropocene series. And so I'm gonna show you some here in a more clunky, we're just talking about the making of it art. But in fact, it is inspired by what is going to happen, which is a brand new digital virtual space experience where hopefully you will get to enter into my art. And um, yeah, so without further ado, let me, let me uh, share my screen again and we can look at some of them. So I'm, I don't have a million subjects going on here. It is a bunch of different ways to look at the same subject. So what we're looking at here is that there must be erosion. And so they have placed large, you know, and, and artistically I'm cheating here because, you know, these strange shape concrete things and this huge fortress like concrete wall are both solutions to beach erosion, but they are two different solutions. And so I don't know that you'd find them in the same place. What happens with both is erosion ends up happening underneath. And so they fail at their job. And so another thing I'm saying here is this wall would end up looking like broken pieces of concrete anyway. I'm showing this ship out here. Look how it's within sight, but it's pretty far away. It's actually a sand dredger. And it's, you know, we can't see under the water, but it's dredging for sand. And I'm making a rainbow-like thing uh, from the beach to the dredger because uh, the way physics works is when they dredge this the ocean floor out here, the sand from here just goes out and fills in whatever hole they've made. So let's say they're dredging to fill this space here. And so and it costs like millions of dollars uh, to our government and to ourselves to do this. So the sand is going back and then the sand is being taken away. And so, and so for us, it's this kind of cycle, cycle, cycle. But this dredging out here is wrecking the environment, which uh, I have shown by sim symbol, because the other thing that's in our water are these plastic bags that I have heard referred to as um, plastic chowder, because it's not so much plastic islands as it is filling the ocean deeply and side to side, and so it's like a, a, a soup of plastic. But we see the victim here of this baby turtle that often in my art, I'm creating uh, pretty dire scenes because the fact is that, um, you know, worse than this baby turtle dying, these, like, these eggs could have never been laid here. Look, the beach is completely taken over. And so, again, it's symbolic for all the things we think about. We think of, uh, you know, the charismatic sea turtles. Sometimes we're often in hyperdrive concern of them. But there would be many charismatic and non-charismatic creatures and plants and other things that relied on this relationship of the water to the beach. So land change is one of our greatest um, destructive forces. The other thing I'm trying to show in this is you can't just go to deserts and get sand because the sand we're getting, we get it to replenish the beaches, but we're usually dredging sand for use in making, guess what? See that concrete, concrete? In making concrete. And also in making glass, but specifically in the making of concrete, it has to be sea sand because 
if you see this magnified sand, it doesn't even look like what we think of as sand, it is all sorts of shapes and broken pieces and irregular. The smooth ball-like sand of the desert makes horrible concrete. And yet, because there are now sand pirates in the world, uh, people are illegally getting sea sand, often from other countries, beaches or waterways. And so, um, even though it isn't actually depicted in this artwork, it's in my brain that I had become aware of sand pirates and uh, a sand shortage, and that sand is considered in the top five important resources of this world, like up there with water and air, as far as things we need to survive. And so I thought, wow, people are not giving enough thought to sand. Um, and when you are a sand pirate, you often don't spend the time washing that sand. And so there are some domino effect. Uh, if it's unwashed sea sand or beach sand in concrete, the steel in the concrete will erode fairly quickly. So you might say to yourself, yes, but Gretchen, you're not mentioning these grapes that are running throughout the whole picture, but that's, that's me uh, kind of being influenced by Salvador Dali. And another thing that is associated with this thing of William Kentridge, which is the idea of using what's around you. And I love grapes, but I tend to uh, eat grapes right off the stem and I'll hold the whole stem. And in doing so, I would constantly uh, be down to the stem and realize, oh, how beautiful that stem is. And I started saving them up and making students draw them. I, I even drew them a couple times. And they morphed into a strong symbol of my art, which is grapes which are voluptuous, juicy, abundant associated with wine, associated with, uh, and so therefore wine is associated with merriment and, and revelry and, you know, kind of almost extreme behavior. So here I'm taking these, these juicy grapes, which is our, uh, how we see the world and we can just, you know, pick those grapes and pick those grapes and eat them, eat them, eat them, eat them. But about halfway through, things are starting to go brown on you. Uh, smaller grapes, browner grapes, stems that don't have any grapes. Till the very end, there's very few grapes and they are not necessarily desirable to eat at this point. They are really uh, kind of deflated, brown, and, and too sparse. And so, this piece is actually called After Dionysus. And so that's a kind of thinking of bricolage of materials, bricolage of ideas, kind of like anything goes. As long as I already had it in my studio, I mean. This one I called Drawing the Anthropocene. Because uh, the other funny thing about this is every time I would do one, I would think it was the last one but there keeps seeming to be more. Uh, probably that will keep happening as long as I still have some paper on that roll. Okay, so here we're talking about uh, another thing uh, that is different from bricolage. So the, the butterflies in this picture are all threatened or endangered and they're all from Florida but they're positioned almost exactly the way Salvador Dali positioned some butterflies in one of his works. And he played with shadows, making shadows that were most likely uh, impossible. And in fact, they're impossible to be at the same time. And so the idea of shadows that look real but are really not real, or shadows being the evidence of something that may disappear or not there, uh, interested me. I, as an artist, once I do my research, uh, and so 
I wanted butterflies. I wanted endangered or threatened butterflies. I wanted them to be from Florida. And I wanted ones that I would see commonly and ones I didn't see commonly. So those four butterflies represent that. And then I forget the species, you know, I probably could come up with them right now, but I need you to know that as an artist, they represent many other butterflies, many other endangered things, that that specificity of being able to, you know, let's say uh, species identify is not that important to me after the making, it's vitally important to me in the making. So all these little oil painted creatures around this golden orb, which is either the sun or the overheated earth, and is also, uh, you know, we have issues of what's real and what's fake and people believing things or not. So this golden orb is real gold leaf with fake gold paint. So all of these species are also species that have some concern. Uh, and so some of them are greatly threatened, but some of them are just concerned. But in every case, the concern has to do with water usage uh, or, or, or climate change, uh, but all about water, you know, the bleaching of the coral or the, there's a disease hitting the coral here locally. Uh, not all of these are local though, but all of them are in trouble. Uh, I want them also to be a variety of species. For instance, this snake is a snake that only uh, appears in the Florida Keys, but it's a subspecies to a species you might have in your backyard here. But that's it. Do we do we care about the subspecies or not? Uh, the Florida scrub jay, it really likes this very unique environment that uh, happens in the middle of our state that most people don't even know about. And the scrub jay is a very interesting creature that we may lose. The other creatures around them uh, were inspired by a line in a book, uh, actually a whole concept of a few articles in the book that spoke of ghost, ghost species. And particularly one article that I think they named the, the grouping of articles after was the author uh, called ghost species, those species which they assumed were there, but they had no evidence like they, the, the species was gone, but there still existed the thing that would have eaten the species or the thing the species would have eaten or some, the plant that depended on the pollinization of that species. So uh, I didn't get that specific with my choice of species, but all of these ghost species are extinct creatures. Again, I'm trying to pick a variety from the um, cute, to the overlooked. For instance, this moth. Uh, I actually had trouble with this moth because I, uh, at the time of research, I researched this kind of plain brown moth from England that they were calling extinct. But then in further readings, it was like, well, maybe it's extinct or maybe it's not, or maybe it's this other species is extinct. They look really close. We're not really sure. Nobody's really looking at the little brown moths. And then the more I did research, the more I realized that there's a whole, there are all these groups of little brown bugs, little brown moths, little, and they often are brown. And I think it's met, very metaphoric for our uh, treatment of people of color that nobody bothers even studying. They don't even care. Like is the little brown moth, this specific one extinct? Well, but there's this other little brown moth. And, and so in the end, the original species I looked at may or may not be extinct, but certainly there were so many others that were in that conversation that they uh, could be. This Cuban snail, I was told was collected to extinction, but I have since read that it is not quite extinct, but it's on the verge of extinction. And so that's kind of a gray area, but it reminded me of the work you may have seen behind me, which is called the extinction of color, which is when people collect uh, animal products, in this case shells, that are colorful. Uh, they often bring the things to extinction. For instance, you know, the great auk. 
brought to extinction uh, for many reasons, but the, the final great auk ever seen had its eggs stolen because the great auk's egg was considered the most beautiful and therefore the most desirable egg for egg collectors to collect. And so therefore, I don't know if you're aware of this, but at least in this country, it is against the law to collect eggs and feathers because so much atrocity has been committed uh, under the name of collecting. The two climate events that are happening is obviously a hurricane. This is, you know, a bridge in the keys and trying to make the ocean a little angry. I decided to throw in this little a vignette because during the making of this I wanted to be a little bit more specific to my corner of the world and so the key deer which is one of those things that is most likely to become a victim of extinction soon that's why look there's a space in the ghost species and then there's the key deer the, 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 the key deer should not go extinct but between land use and cars and dogs and pythons and then, well, uh, poorly aimed hurricanes and disease could, could wipe them out suddenly. And this stop sign I also took from a photograph of a hurricane in the Keys to, to just put a little note to that. While I'm also dealing with things that are not close to me, which is the calving of ice sheets uh, and glaciers and you know that comes into the category of the thing that you assume you'll always have but then you don't always have it and so that's really a shame that we may lose some things that are dear to us this piece is about time and I would say that the main reason I would like to show you this is because I actually am in possession of all of those pocket watches and they're, they're all different. Um, and the time that they're set on is the time they are. They are all broken. Uh, I've taken one or two to a jeweler to see if they can be fixed. I was told not, not really um, or it would cost too much. But so they are somebody else's and this person who gave me these, gave these to me in his lifetime. It's my husband's grandfather. And he ended up willing in his will, the functioning dear to his heart lifetime pocket watch also. But for some reason, pocket watches were important to him. Uh, he had a series of broken ones. He had this one gorgeous one that was not broken. Uh, and we have them all. And I decided that all the issues we're talking about, including about the environment, all seem to come down to time. You know, do we have enough time? So this piece also was premeditatedly made to be quite pretty because, uh, you know, I often get accused of in inserting fairly ugly things in my work or even having the whole work be too disturbing for people to see. Uh, so even though there is plenty of disturbing stuff in here, uh, I'm trying to fool the eye. So, uh, so all this lacy stuff, all this lacy stuff that you see, I decided that, you know, this idea of charismatic species that we are fully aware of whether they're endangered or not. What about species that some people don't even know what they are? all of these species of lichen on this page, which I think there are about five or six different species all mixed together, um, are gravely endangered. And, and so that has many things about it. One of which is I could accomplish this idea of the lacy pretty art that sucks people in it could be a shout out to my daughter who actually has her PhD in lichenology. And so therefore, uh, I don't have to work too hard to, uh, to know about lichens. There are the watches surrounding 
this orb, which might be the Earth, obviously it's, it's suggesting the Earth, are roads, many of which are uh, existing in Florida, but a few of them that were really decorative from other parts of the United States I also incorporated. So the roads are so intertwined now, I can't tell who, who's who anymore, but I took a bunch of roads and just turned them into some lacy, ribbony surrounding the earth because uh, so the earth is surrounded by lichen going extinct while people don't even know it's there. It's, it's being really surrounded by roads the earth itself seems to be having some violent weather here. We have some pollution going on. We have a forest fire. You know, these forest fires are really devastating and actually feed global warming. And so there's a real looping effect. Uh, this is again, uh, suggestive of hurricane events or tsunamis. Uh, all of this arrows is trying to make us aware that there's this whole event that nobody pays much attention to on a daily basis, which is here is our atmosphere. And, you know, the hot sun rays come in. So, you know, they are a little lesson coming in, but they should be able to go right out, in and out. Um, so we have an entrapment of the temperature. And then with a little bit of humor and also with a background of interest in mythological uh, iconographies, the Egyptians have the scarab, which is uh, the renewer of life, which is based on their uh, dung beetle. Well, in Florida, we have our dung beetle, but what the dung beetle does is it takes something that we think of as gross, and most people wrap it in plastic and put in their trash, which completely horrifies me, but um, if a dung beetle comes across, and many, many other creatures depend on the excrement of whatever's living around, and if we've taken our neighborhoods and we've taken all the deer out of there and all the other large mammals, our dogs might be the only thing available to the little things of this earth that rely on dung. So the dung beetle gets quite excited about it, uh, forms a ball, digs a hole, and buries the dung in a hole uh, and lays its eggs. And so therefore, out of that hole comes, you know, new dung beetles. And that is why the Egyptians thought that from basically excrement came life and I felt like that fit very close to my idea of, you know, we have all these negative things, but uh, like waste or pollution or oh, all the things that are hurting uh, our environment. But, you know, what if, what if we saw a way that like the dung beetle, we can utilize what we have to, to create life as opposed to death. So this piece is dealing with a lot of subjects that are, uh, again, dealing with what is creating the Anthropocene. But again, it is many, many things that tap right back into that bricolage idea. So I'm watching the news and there are the fish kills happening because of our red tides and the green algae. And so I decided to make the fish themselves red and green as they're dead on the edge there. I went to the Deering Estate and they have a seawall, which would fit like my other piece into that idea of a coastal hardening, which is not good for the environment. But there was this one a mangrove tree that was growing from the other side of the seawall and establishing roots on this side of the seawall. And I actually think this is not going to be the last time I use that concept because I, I, I found it beautiful. 
Also, you can see that there is a little bit of spillover of the, the salt water. And yet, even though this isn't at Deering, so it has nothing to do with Deering, but some of this fish kill, the bacteria, and some of this is really deadly bacteria, they thought was all about runoffs from cattle or, or sugarcane uh, fertilizer. But in fact, when biologists tested the water, it was human excrement bio, uh, bacteria. And so I did further research and it turns out our entire coast from up and down the entire coast has septic tank after septic tank. And those septic tanks are absolutely uh, violated and compromised by sea level rise. And it doesn't take much because the septic tanks are actually under the sand. I've, I've allowed it to be exposed because uh, in extreme cases of erosion and hurricane, uh, this will happen. But in fact, usually these septic tanks, you're not seeing them, they're under, but they are still being compromised. And so therefore the pollution's going in Sea level rise is also bringing salt into the environment that salt shouldn't be. And although I don't technically have water on this side of the wall, uh, our fresh aquifers are being compromised um, completely. But these little salt shakers, which, oops, I can't go too big because I'm losing resolution. But these little salt shakers, again, I thought, well, how do I depict salt intrusion. And so I ran to my kitchen like William Kentridge would have done. And lo and behold, I had this funky diner, old diner salt shaker. And a friend of mine who has uh, passed away now, passed away of leukemia, before he moved back to England, because he knew he was uh, dying. He gave me a bunch of his household things and it was funny because I remember thinking to myself I don't I don't want these things I don't necessarily you know the salt shaker was not necessarily my taste but I decided that in an act of love I would take whatever he gave me once he gave it to me I acted like a bracolure and held on to most of it or found somebody who valued it. Uh, but the salt shakers are still my main salt shakers in my kitchen. So when I went to make this art uh, and wanted to show salt intrusion, I could just simply look at Jeffrey's salt shaker and uh, have it be there. And because of that, I particularly love my little salt shakers. And, and in fact, I didn't mention it earlier, but that's another layer to the making of the art is even if I'm dealing with environmental things, I am embedding materials or images that are so loaded with meaning to me that maybe nobody will ever get. Like, you know, somebody has to go, but I challenge you all to run to Deering and find find that mangrove. It's still there. It's, it, it was really a smaller mangrove with just a few um, roots over when I first saw it. And I actually added to the root thing because you often have to exaggerate. But I think it has actually grown to be closer to my drawing than it was when I drew my drawing. These humans are architectural humans because of building up the earth. And I, I love beautiful architecture, so I'm not anti-architecture. But in fact, I think we have to be careful with the idea of development always being a good thought. And certainly uh, the numbers of people are symbolically related to the uh, billions of people that exist on the earth now. By the way, all of these materials, you can see I've used wetness in almost everything here. Even these guys are colored with coffee. And this paper was extremely unhappy about that. As I was talking about all the things about this pandemic, I was inspired to 
create another piece, not only for the Frank, thinking that maybe uh, if I worked hard in the summer, but you know, remember the, some of my methodology makes the hard part, the idea generation, then the research behind the idea. But the idea behind this piece was that I was making a piece about the environment during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. And at that point, I realized that I could not think of those things as separate, that everything about the pandemic may have even come out of some things we are doing to our fellow creatures or our environment that we shouldn't be doing, because uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but most of the major pandemics have been something that jumps species Sometimes there is a vector species between the two species, but often it is when humans have encroached in an area that they don't normally live in or have access to, or we've brought the creatures who carry that virus into our environment in situations that uh, lead to uh, bacteria growing as opposed to dying. And so, there's been speculation and so and I also think for our purposes in my idea of environmental things it is never important if species specificity is exactly on the money because if it's not it's representational of whatever it is so if I understand it correctly uh, there are bats by the nature of their life and the immunities they've built up over millennia have created in them the ability to have multiple coronaviruses that they live with all the time and that doesn't really make bats bad it just it just is and many other species like we have things that you know uh we carry with us as a species but what happened is that in the acceleration of global trade of animal products animals as exotic pets bush meat and encroachment on land for changing land use we have the perfect storm of situations and uh they still don't know uh, from from bat to human was there a vector species it looks like there was, they don't know what it was, but this piece is based on one of the speculation species because that speculation species already could be something that I would want to address artistically. And that is a pangolin. The pangolin has, is, is adorable. And there's a few species of pangolin, but they're all pretty much under fire right now. And uh, for pet trade, exotic pets, but also for their meat, if I'm not mistaken, but definitely for medicine because they have little scales on them. And I don't know if we'll be able to see them, but they're in the drawers. So in the drawers of my Statue of Liberty are most likely not alive, although some of them might be kind of alive, little pangolins. Uh, Some of them you're just seeing the scales because the scales are what is possibly putting them in danger. Uh, this is again based uh, for a couple of the drawings I got a little far afield from Salvador Dali. But in this case, two things were the seed of this piece. While in the coronavirus, I started to play around with making homemade inks. So in the conversation with how can I help others who are not used to being stuck at home in using what they already have, how can I explore further in helping others? And so I started to create homemade inks and all the books I could find on them assume I live in a temperate zone or up north. And so most of the recipes you can find to make homemade inks are not very uh, usable here in South Florida. We don't have the right trees. We don't have the right you know, weed, we don't have the right plant, um, we certainly don't have the right bug, but to 
two of the recipes that really appealed to me in their simplicity and the fact that I had the thing absolutely at hand. One was copper ink, uh, which doesn't turn out to be copper color. Copper ink is where you take sc copper scraps, mix it with vinegar and let it, be, let it corrode in, over time until the ink is like the patina of the Statue of Liberty. So I made this green blue patina ink from copper. Then I made rust ink. So that brown you see is rust ink made from rust. Though those inks I made because of being locked down in the coronavirus and trying to talk to others about what you could do with what you already have mixed with the fact that I already wanted to make a piece about the coronavirus and thinking about the pangolins and then readdressing, looking through Salvador Dali's work and finding this female bent over with drawers coming out of her made the Statue of Liberty actually painted in the exact copper ink that she actually would be made out of. Statue of Liberty symbolizing everything from immigration so it all had to do with Statues of Liberty. Statue of Liberty, as we all well know, is in New York. So you have to have a skyline. And also in looking at Salvador Dali's work, he often had a horizon line. But those are in fact not buildings, but those are a wet market. Bunches of cages that uh, really none of it is made up. All these little cages and things including, uh, it's really hard to identify it, but those two things are actually disinfectant cleaning products that I saw in one picture of uh, these wet markets. The houses, of course, are about development, but also about our uh, harboring ourselves against the world we've created. But in fact, in this house, coronavirus is in that house. In this house, it looks like it's certainly trying to get in, and some has gotten in. The other three houses do not have coronavirus in, although this one has some threatening coronavirus. And remember my scissor story? So here they are. Here are the sharp bladed scissors and the string, which Again, I'm playing with something. A few years ago, I went to Washington, D.C. In fact, it was right after President Trump was elected. And I was at the National Archive gift shop. And they had some earrings which had little pieces of pinkish cotton ribbon. So the ribbon looked very much like this raw cotton I had, but it was slightly pinkish. And I said, what are these about? And they said, oh, when we were renovating the National Archive, they found an old storage closet with all the scraps of this pink ribbon. And they decided to commission a, an artist to make earrings with little pieces of the ribbon in it. Because what it was is they don't actually practice this anymore, but from the beginning of our country and for many, many years, very important documents were tied up and sealed with this pinkish ribbon and if you needed to access it you had to cut it and that is how that phrase of cutting through red tape came to be and so i'm playing with i, I like to play with uh, that kind of a uh, little wording hopefully the statue of liberty is twisted and off balance enough to uh, get across just how off balance I think the situation is. Basically, we're talking about uh, materials that go to such an extreme that I now am making my own materials for that latest one. And then the making of the material actually became the subject. I think without making copper ink, there would have been no Statue of Liberty. I, I have not blatantly done political imagery, even though I would argue everything's political. And so therefore everything environmental is severely political. Uh, but 
this is the most obviously political art that I have added to my environmental collection. And, but that idea of the materials feeding the subject. Uh, so like when I'm doing the molecular diagrams of ocean acidity in the one drawing, I'm using those cartoon blue pencils that came from an antique store and was given to me as a gift a long time ago. Um, and the paper just seems loaded. You know, sometimes when I'm using the paper, I think, oh, is there a back and front to this paper? Because I notice that there's like a little bit of writing of, I guess, the company or whatever on the very edge. And it's very random, you know, it's backwards or forwards and stuff. The, that paper does not want water. It is not archival. So uh, I don't know what will happen to these works in time. I, I, don't, I really actually don't know what happens to those homemade inks. So that's an interesting idea. My artworks almost never turn into commodities. That's all right. I, I love this opportunity that the Frank is uh, affording me, which I don't think of as these works that I've shown you uh, being shown digitally. I believe with Taryn and some digital artist help, we will be creating brand new work. And that's exciting because that is using what you have at hand with the environment you have. Upcycling, recycling, cannibalizing, reusing, uh, collage, assemblage, these are, these are things that uh, feed this art. There are things like when I was a young girl, the average trash can uh, was 31 gallons. And I could carry the trash can out to the edge. When I was really little, the trash man came all the way up to the house and got it. But eventually they did expect you to take it out to the edge. But you know, I could carry it as a child, all 31 gallons of trash. But as an adult, I have the aptly named Green Monsters. And did you know that they are 64 gallons? That's more than double. We have to think about what we consume, where we, where we get it from. My kitty litter is made from the byproduct of corn, made from corn cob. Years ago, I was suspicious I was more allergic to the kitty litter than I was to the cats. And turns out, guys, do your research. You might think that's made out of clay. A few brands are made out of clay, but they, they're rare. Most of that kitty litter is this god awful substance that's mined and is very closely related to asbestos. And it is, it is horrible for the earth to be mined and it is horrible to the earth to be thrown out. And the joke is on everybody, corn cobs do a better job. And so what happens is this bricolage idea, it just grows. It, it ends up being that there's no part of life not thought out. So I'm saving my grape stems. I'm painting portraits of dried grapefruit rinds. I find those scissors that were my father's and I hope you will too.